Now is not the time to tell the story of GMA 500 graphics. Maybe another time when I have more liquor in this apartment. When I have more liquor in this apartment. When I have more liquor in this apartment. Let's see. Huh? Basically, anyone who has been interested in computers for a while is familiar with the name Intel GMA and probably have less than kind connotations with it. Regardless of how you may or may not feel about it, if you had an Intel-powered budget machine from the mid to late 2000s, chances are you'd find some flavor of GMA solution driving your screen. But not all GMA designs were created equal, and one stands apart from the others. And not necessarily for the right reasons. This is the story of GMA 500. But first, to understand why it ever existed, we need a bit of backstory. A lot of backstory, actually. But I promise we'll get there. Just a few days ago in my first video, we already saw the GMA 900. This cheerfully underperforming premiere to the GMA series showed up in 2004 with the Intel 915 series chipsets, which were designed to be paired with late model Pentium 4 and Pentium M CPUs. It was quickly followed up the year after with the GMA 950, which of course was a proper high performance GPU. <laughs> Just kidding, it was basically just an overclocked GMA 900. This version found its way into the 945 series chipsets, designed to support the final generation of Pentium 4s, as well as Intel's shining new return to form, the Core 2 family. The GMA 950 also had its own successors in the coming years, sometimes with cutting edge features such as unified shaders, but it itself would find new life in a brand new market segment. Lollipop, lollipop, oh lolly, 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 lollipop. Boom, boom, boom. Welcome back to the year 2008. Watch your step because the Beijing Olympics are going on and all those banks that were definitely too big to fail are failing anyway. But in the world of electronics, everything is great. We have computers in our pockets now and they can play Angry Birds. But it's not just our phones getting smart, it's also our existing computers getting dumb? No, small. That's what I should have said. Over the last couple years, we've seen the rise of the UMPC, or Ultra Mobile PC. These devices so far have shoved aging CPUs, intended for embedded systems, into the smallest packages possible, some packages more appealing than others. Also with aging embedded CPUs comes aging embedded CPU performance. Now, let's talk about Intel's contribution to the UMPC market. In 2007, they released the McCaslin platform. This used the Steely family CPU, which, long story short, is basically just a cut-down Dothan Pentium M. This is also long before the modern era of all CPUs being their own SoC, so it needs a chipset to go with it. You probably get where I'm going with this, and if so, you're right. Paired with the Steely Core, we get a flavor of the 945 chipset, with our old friend, GMA950. But without the one upgrade that actually made it the 950. In fact, it's clocked even slower than the GMA900 I tested previously. I can only imagine how that would perform, but I'd really rather not. The following year, Intel released their first proper Ultra Mobile series of XA6 CPUs, the Atom series. This first generation lineup consists of two families, Diamondville for netbooks and net tops, and Silverthorn for UMPCs and MIDs. Diamondville, being for a slightly more traditional market segment, was a slightly more traditional platform, making use of the brand new GL40, uh, GL960? Really Intel? Still the 945? Were you trying to sandbag your brand new platform? <clears throat> Diamondville was paired with its own variant of the 945 chipset. 
again with GMA 950 graphics, and again, it's clocked even slower than most original GMA 900 implementations. Now, where did that bottle go? And that wasn't even the best part. The design team on the Atom project did an incredible job optimizing the power efficiency of the core. The Diamondville chips have a TDP of 2 to 4 watts. At idle, they can pull as little as 80 milliwatts. The version of the 945 Northbridge they were designed to be paired with, on the other hand. And don't forget your South Bridge. That's not great. When your chipset is pulling four times the power that your CPU is, something is very wrong. And don't forget, these were supposed to go in very portable, lifestyle computers, which you take everywhere you go. Good job, Intel. Alright, now we finally get to the platform that this video is ostensibly about, Intel's Menlo platform. The Menlo platform was Intel's replacement for the previously mentioned McCaslin platform, taking the reign in the UMPC market. It replaced that poor kneecapped Pentium Mam with the Silverthorn family Atom. As for the chipset, Intel at least had someone with common sense here, because for once they did not reuse the 945. Say hello to the Poolsbo SCH, or System Controller Hub. This chipset provides more or less the same features as the 945 plus ICH7 Southbridge while pulling one quarter of the power. How the hell did they accomplish that? Well, three reasons. Number one, not pulling a two-year-old laptop chipset out of their e-waste pile. Two, lower power signaling logic on the front side bus. And three, GMA 500. Yes, we're this far into the video, and just now have gotten to the actual subject. So at long last, let's actually talk about GMA 500. How's GMA 500 so much more efficient? Did they already take the bare bones GMA series and cut down its capabilities even more? Well, no. Did they find some magic way to make the pixel shaders run on a tiny fraction of the power? No. Did they open a portal into the dimension of unicorns and rainbows? Sadly, no. So. What did they do? They... cheated. The graphics core known as GMA500 also has another name, a name that is arguably better known as. That name is PowerVR SGX535. The same GPU that powered the iPhone 3GS and iPhone 4, with close relatives also powering dozens of other smartphones, tablets, and developer boards from around the turn of the decade. In short, Intel threw up their hands and licensed a design from a company that knew how to do the job better. So, let's look at the hardware specs of GMA500, nay SGX535. This design is part of the PowerVR Series 5 family, and provides two pixel pipelines plus two vertex shaders. Alright, editor's note here. There is a lot of misinformation around the internet when it comes to these PowerVR designs. I'd found a few sources in agreement that the SGX family has discrete shaders, but while researching some other info later in development, I discovered an article from Imagination Technologies themselves, and it proves the opposite. The SGX family is in fact a unified shader design, which technically is against the rules for GPU June. However, this thing's story is pretty unique, and I haven't seen it told cohesively anywhere else. So I'm still going to take this opportunity to tell the story. Sorry Nathan, hope you let this stay in the playlist. All clocked at 200 megahertz. Given the clock speed, this provides a pixel fill rate of 400 megapixels per second. As for API support, we find DirectX 9.0C, OpenGL 2.1, and OpenGL ES 2.0. For the uninitiated, OpenGL ES is a subset of OpenGL designed for mobile and embedded systems. Given the target market for the SGX 535, this would be the most commonly used API in practice, but given we're looking at it as the GMA500 in the context of a standard computer GPU, we'll be looking more at the other two. I'm sorry to interrupt the relaxing view, but I think it's long past time I actually introduce the device we're testing today. Here we go. 
this is the Wise X90 CW, or what I affectionately call the Not a Netbook. Why do I call it that? It's because if you ask Wise, it's not a netbook. It's a mobile thin client. Please ignore the fact that it appears to be identical to a BenQ netbook. That's definitely just coincidence. Anyway, this machine has an Atom Z520, which is, of course, of the previously mentioned Silverthorn family. This means it has exactly what we need for this video, the Poolsbo SCH with GMA500 graphics. This machine is also equipped with 1GB of DDR2 memory, running at 266MHz. If that sounds slow to you, that's because it is. But that's what it wants to run at, and there's zero settings in the BIOS to allow me to change that, so it is what it is. Anyway, we'll be benchmarking this machine with the same suite of tests as I used in my first Battle of the Low End video. That's 3D Mark 2001, 3D Mark 2005, Half-Life 2, and Unreal Tournament 2004. All of these tests are admittedly quite old for a platform that came out in 2008, but this time, even more so than the previous video, I think going for brand new games would be asking a little too much from this hardware. You'll see what I mean in a moment. Now, with that out of the way, let's get started. Starting off with 3D Mark 2001, we have, uh, interesting results. The GMA500 brings comparatively very impressive texture fill rates, but for everything else, uh, let's just say these scores would have been underwhelming when this benchmark came out, seven years before this platform launched. In fact, hardware launched years before this benchmark can do better. I found an antidote that SLI Voodoo 2 cards get a score better than this. The situation is not any better in 3D Mark 2005. In fact, it's even worse. The GMA500 has lost its lead in texture fill rate, for whatever good that did it, and is still far behind in everything else, except the complex vertex shader test? It's still losing there, but it almost matches the GMA900. Let's take what we can get. In Half-Life 2, we... Uh... What? Establish... My, my administration issue here. Oh god, please get me out of here. In Unreal Tournament 2004, we see yet another sad performance out of the GMA 500, with frame rates of about one quarter of the other devices on the chart. And reminder, those are not high-end GPUs. Those are integrated graphics from 2005. At this point, I feel like I basically have to find a game that can properly play on this thing. Let's see. Yeah, that'll work. At this point, you may be wondering why this performance is just so bad, and you're right to be wondering that. Remember, this is the same graphics card that was in many early iOS and Android devices. Obviously, those weren't exactly packing graphics performance matching high-end desktop cards, but go look at some of the 3D mobile games from that time, and you'll see that the GMA500 should be able to do much better than what we saw a moment ago. There's one reason for that. Drivers. If you're looking for a TLDR, there's no option but to be a bit blunt. Intel half-assed the drivers for GMA500. Or, to be more specific, they contracted Tungsten Graphics to develop the drivers, rather than getting Imagination Technologies to port their own perfectly functional drivers. On the surface, this sounds like a decent idea. Tungsten was a company with an existing pedigree in graphics driver development, including those for other Intel GMA designs, as well as extensive open source contributions to Mesa, the most popular graphics rendering platform on Linux. Despite all this, the performance ended up far worse than it had any right to be. And despite Tungsten's genuinely friendly demeanor towards it, the situation was even worse on Linux. That substory has already been told better than I could retell it, so I'll leave some links in the video description if you want to do some reading. But in short, the Linux drivers got developed and updated for about a year, and then were left to rot, 
with no chance of the community keeping it up to date. As for why all this happened, I unfortunately don't have an answer. I can't find anyone on the internet with an authoritative answer either. If anyone out there knows what happened behind the scenes, I'd love to hear it. There does seem to be a bit of a conspiracy theory, however, that it was intentional as to not damage the market share of Intel's more upscale platforms. I'll leave it up to the viewer to decide if they subscribe to that train of thought. Regardless of why it happened, it's clear that this was not an ideal situation for Intel. Even though systems based on the Poolsbow platform were relatively common, it certainly was not the way forward. That applies not only to Intel's strategy, but also for the market as a whole. UMPCs turned out to be a brief, although exciting, flash in the pan. In retrospect, it's pretty obvious why. The same advances in technology that allowed PCs to reach low TDPs while retaining performance also allowed smartphones to rapidly gain performance without blowing the power budget. If your smartphone can serve all your ultra-portable computing needs, why would you bring an ultra-mobile PC with you too? If anything, GMA500, as well as the Poolsbow platform surrounding it, was a stopgap while Intel's engineers gained knowledge and expertise in the art of low-power silicon design. Even if the era of the UMPC and the netbook has long since left us, the legacy of these devices does live on somewhat in modern thin and light laptops with their much more modern GPUs. Of course, none of these use a PowerVR design. Intel certainly never used one of those again, right? Damn it. <laughs> Thanks for watching. This video has been a month-long project throughout the month of June for the GPU June event. Even though I have my doubts this video really gets the count for that event, I'll still recommend that you watch the videos in that playlist if you haven't already checked it out. I also hope you enjoyed this video and maybe learned a bit about an off-forgotten and even more off-maligned bit of tech from the late 2000s. I definitely enjoyed making this, even if there were some late nights trying to get it done on time. Till next time, goodbye.